Good morning and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lauren Wenzel and I am the director of the National Marine Protected Areas Center at NOAA. And we're very pleased to be hosting this webinar today together with OCTO. Uh, and it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, several young professionals who are gonna be with us and talking about uh, developing a youth action toolkit uh, for ocean health and conservation. And I will introduce our speakers here in just a minute. I'm gonna give you a little bit of background about the uh, topic today um, and also how we're gonna run the webinar. So um, today we're gonna to be talking about a um, new product that has been developed through the Ocean Foundation and the National Geographic Society with a group of young writers between the ages of 18 and 25 who have created a youth action, ocean action toolkit, which is focused on ocean literacy principles and marine protected areas. And this toolkit is written by youth for youth and provides community examples of how youth can take action to conserve their ocean. And it will be available this summer in English and Spanish. So we're really excited to hear from our, uh, our writer, writing team today. Uh, and so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce them. And I also just wanted to note that after the presentation, there is gonna be plenty of time for Q&A. So we encourage you to put your questions in the question box and we will make sure to get to those and look forward to having a really great conversation with you after the presentation. So um, we have with us today, Francis Lang from the Ocean Foundation, who is based in San Diego, California and founded the award-winning nonprofit organization, Ocean Connectors, and then joined the Ocean Foundation's core staff last year, where she leads the Community Ocean Engagement Global Initiative, focused on creating equitable access to marine education programs and careers throughout the world. Then we have Ajay Savant from the Apollo College of Veterinary Medicine. Um, often we fall in love with something before we decide to protect it. For Ajay, born and raised by the Arabian Sea, his connection to the vast expanse of ocean was forged at an early age. And ever since then, he has purposed art and storytelling in creating awareness through World Ocean Day, BOCED Ocean Awareness Programs, the National Geographic Society, and the Nature Conservancy. Then we have Rebecca Allen from Western Washington University. Uh, she's from Washington State, where she developed her love of whales through local efforts to protect the Southern resident orcas and her passion for education through the Girl Scouts of Western Washington. She is currently pursuing a bachelor's degree in environmental studies with an emphasis on education and eco-social justice. And she aspires to make the world a better place by increasing the future generation's ocean literacy. Next, we have Julia Lara Navarrete, from the Autonomous University of Baja, California. Uh, she is born and raised in Mexico City, and Julia fell in love with the Pacific Ocean and vowed to protect it. She has just finished an oceanography degree in UAPC and is working on her thesis at the Monitoring Ecosystems Across the California Lab. And she looks forward to bridging the gap between science and storytelling through projects like this one. And then we have Sirag Heba, from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And he is an ocean advocate and writer from Alexandria, Egypt, and is currently based in Hong Kong where he is completing his bachelor's degree in engineering and working with Think Ocean. And lastly, we have Summer Snell from Brooks University who worked for the public engagement team of the UK's largest aquarium for three and a half years. And she has been part of the World Ocean Day Youth Advisory Council, as well as the Youth Leadership Council for Earth Echo International and is currently training to become a primary school teacher at Brooks University. So I will now hand it over to Francis to take us, take us forward. Thanks. Thank you, Lauren. So my name is Francis Lang. I'm a program officer at the Ocean Foundation. And as Lauren mentioned, I'm based in San Diego, California in the United States. I'm going to provide a little background about our work at the Ocean Foundation. I'll share about the initiative that I lead at the Ocean Foundation, and then I'll turn things over to the youth authors to share about their experience working on the Youth Ocean Action Toolkit. And I wanna send a thank you out to OCTO and the MPA Center for hosting this webinar and for giving us an opportunity to share about our project. I'd also like to thank National Geographic for their support, as well as the many experts and local community members who shared their knowledge and their stories with us throughout this project. Next slide, please. The Ocean Foundation was founded in, in 2003. We're dedicated to reversing the trend of destruction of ocean environments around the world. 
We are very much a global organization. We have projects on every continent and key focus areas for our work include ocean acidification and monitoring, plastic pollution prevention and blue carbon, especially mangrove and coral habitat restoration. And as a nonprofit community foundation, we offer fiscal sponsorship services, research and consulting, committee advised funds, and other nonprofit services. We are the only community foundation for the ocean. Next slide, please. In my role, I lead the Community Ocean Engagement Global Initiative. We call it COGI for short, which is focused on empowering and supporting the marine education community. We launched COGI just last year, so it's a fairly new initiative, and soon we'll be starting a training, mentorship, and certification program for educators, and also are increasing our involvement with the broader environmental literacy community. Next slide, please. So Koji works in a few different areas as shown here on the screen. The development of the Youth Ocean Action Toolkit falls into the category of curriculum development for us. And the purpose of the toolkit is to share the importance of ocean literacy and marine protected areas or MPAs from a youth perspective and for a youth audience. So prioritizing youth voices was important for us throughout this project. The toolkit contains a collection of stories and case studies illustrating the power of collaboration, community action, and youth activism in conserving our worldwide ocean. So with that, I'll pass the mic to the amazing young leaders who have worked very hard on this project for the past six months. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm AJ, and I'm very excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. So for this toolkit, I was particularly responsible for writing four sections, which are global goals, MPAs around the world, Hawaii, protect new and social media. So starting with the MPAs around the world, Hawaii, um, Hawaii is a wonderful, beautiful, wonderful island with all its glory in, in beaches. So conserving the waters over there is such an important part. Um, the main highlight of the story is the CBSFA, which is community-based fishing subsistence areas, which the local communities have developed. Uh, and in, in similar context, in terms of new, the local communities have come together. So in general, when, when we're talking about uh, this toolkit, the main highlight is people coming together to protect a really precious resource that exists on our planet, which, which is basically interconnected to most of the things that happen on land as well. Um, but a particular focus that I, I have for this uh, toolkit is the global events and relevance of the global events that take place uh, all the time. Global events and conferences like COP, IMPACT, and UNOC are essential because uh, they are where the strategies are formed and uh, countries actually decide how to go forward with conservation. At the same time, uh, very often what happens is that uh, these conferences might come up with unrealistic um, goals which which are not really achievable leading to formation of paper parks um, the perspective which i'm trying to build here is that they're really relevant because despite all of this paper park formation or all the pressure that is put on by the by the conferences on the countries it's it is still that these are the conferences which are pushing nations towards conserving the global oceans and if not there would not be enough efforts which are taking place on ground level to protect them so to prevent the formation of paper parks it is essential that we set a global target which is realistic at the same time achievable um, but despite all of these challenges the final effort uh, that is being taken is conservation of these crucial elements and fight for the planet's natural resource so this particular toolkit we are hoping that we will encourage young people to say even start with social media go out and advocate for the marine protected areas their are natural resources which exist besides them like say the local waters uh, be it ocean be it any other water resource um, go out there uh, tell, tell educate people about the importance of marine protected areas and why they need to be conserved next slide please
So as I said, the ultimate goal, despite all of these treaties, like uh, the latest one, which protects high seas, 30% of high seas, COP, impact, you know, and all other conferences is protection and conservation. Uh, despite these challenges which we are facing in global events, uh, conferences remain a crucial instrument to protect our planet's natural resource and biodiversity. They enable countries to work together and achieve, achieve mutual objectives by supporting each other. And that is how we are finally going to find a victory in conservation. Thank you. I am hoping everyone can hear me. Somebody nod, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to tell you about the three sections that I was responsible for. Um, so Ocean 101 was talking about ocean literacy, mostly. And um, don't know what I just heard. Sorry. Um, so ocean literacy and how uh, just kind of the basics of what how we interact with and view our ocean. And then I also wrote uh, about a marine protected area, for those who don't know, that's what MPA stands for. Um, and the protected area that I wrote about, or one of them, I wrote about two, but one of them was uh, Guayanas in K BC, British Columbia, Canada. Um, and Guayanas is, uh, it is a long title, but it is a marine protected area, and it's, as far as I am aware, the only protected area that protects an ecosystem from seafloor all the way to mountaintop. So it's very special because it uh, incorporates a lot of really unique biodiverse habitats and um, species. It's also very special, as you can see in the image, um, for it, the homeland. It's the homeland of the Haida First Nation. And so a lot of their cultural sites are very significant in this protected area. And then I also wrote about um, Franz Josef Land, um, which is basically the northernmost point in Russia. It's actually the northernmost point in all of Eurasia. And so it's closest you can get to the North Pole from there, uh, which is kind of exciting. But Unfortunately, you have to have a permit to go there because it's very, very remote and very cold considering it's in the Arctic. Um, so very cool habitat there in seeing the changes that climate change has caused. Um, and that article is talking about an expedition to explore what, what's there, what's going on, what has changed. Um, can I, next slide, please? Thank you. So I want to tell you a little bit about ocean literacy, um, which is kind of one of the goals of this toolkit that uh, my co-authors and I have been talking about and as using ocean literacy as like a technique to um, communicate about the ocean in an effective way. Um, so these shown here are the seven essential principles of ocean literacy, which um, is in there's like an ocean literacy guide um, that you can find online and um, it basically just breaks down all of all this big abstract concept of ocean literacy which is defined as um, an understanding of how you impact your ocean but also how the ocean impacts you so there's a lot that goes into that and these seven principles helps break that down a little bit and then the guide also presents um, like further it, it further breaks each one down so that it can be applied to um, education standards and so that uh, teachers can implement it into their curriculum, which is pretty exciting. And that's really important to help spread that education. I'm kind of biased because I'm, I'm majoring in education and that's, that's what I'm pursuing. But that education is important because with knowledge, we gain more confidence in our communication skills, which can help help spread our goal of ocean protection. Thank you for your time. Okay, thanks, Rebecca. And we were able to hear you perfectly, but your screen is frozen. So you might try turning it off and then back on again when we get to the panel discussion. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Julia. Uh, thank you for having us all here. It's very exciting. 
I'm going to quickly walk you through some of the sections I wrote for this toolkit. Uh, the first one was MPAs at a glance. That was meant as an introduction to what a marine protected area is and what it can do. It was very exciting because I got to read uh, through very technical definitions of what an MPA is from inter international conventions and then kind of like um, water them down a little so they can be a little bit more, uh, they can be explained to people that are not as technical or aren't as skilled in some areas and that they can still understand what a marine protected area is and what it can do to help. Uh, this section also uh, helps to provide an overview of the goals and what our marine protected areas around the world are. Uh, for the MPAs around the world section, I got to write about a community-led uh, MPA in the Philippines called the Palatine Marine Sanctuary. And I got to connect with different people from other NGOs that helped me dive a little deeper into what a community-led MPA is, entails in this part of the world. And to wrap it all up, I got to do a profile on Dr. Shireen Rahimi, who is an Iranian-American marine anthropologist and filmmaker, which was as incredible as it was inspiring. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so as another of the overarching themes of what we were trying to achieve with this toolkit was uh, science communication because which is commonly known as an umbrella term for the practice of informing and educating and raising awareness about science related topics and by doing something for youth by youth uh, our main aim was to connect with our peers and try to put it in a level where everyone could be able to understand even if you're not a scientist or you're not very in tune with the with the activism, the ocean activism nowadays. Because an important part of the scientific method is sharing and comparing results. And as Sir Mark Walpert put it in this quote, science isn't finished until it's communicated. And what I've seen happen is we as researchers aim to communicate what we find, but to other researchers, not to the rest of the world. And uh, that's where we're going wrong because we need to stop making science for science's sake and start learning how to share these findings with other people, with communities that need and must have the information in order to adapt to what's happening nowadays. Thank you. So, hi everyone, my, my name is Sirog. Um, good evening from Hong Kong. And my apologies if you can hear some background noise. Um, it's 1 a.m. here and I can't stop <laughs> other students from playing music and having fun. Um, so I'll talk about the sections I was responsible for mainly. Um, so those are the three that you see right now. The first one is campaign how to. So that one is written for other youth ocean advocates and environmental advocates on how to lead and create successful uh, advocacy campaigns. So this is some practical advice um, combining my own experience as well as the experience of others um, and other resources that I found online. I've also written a section called Path to Creating an MPA. So this section is meant to kind of inform the many steps that go into the establishment of an MPA around the world. So it's not specific to any one country as that would be essentially impossible to write um, because every country has its own processes, its own unique systems. But the section I really want to focus on is the last one. So that's MPAs around the world, California. Um, so the MPA I focus on is the proposed Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary. So you see that in the map. It's just off the coast of uh, near Santa Barbara in central California. Um, so that's what I'm going to be talking about right now. Next slide, please. Thank you. So storytelling is a big part of this toolkit and what it aims to achieve. Um, obviously, it's not possible to use storytelling in each section, but this was one section where I think it was particularly possible and where I tried my best to incorporate elements of storytelling. So to kind of walk you through how I did that, um, I just want to show it to you from my perspective. So actually, this MPA is quite 
special uh, to me personally because it was it's in an area that I was in for six months last year. Um, I was on exchange at the University of California in Santa Barbara. So I was, without knowing it already, in the waters or you know on the off the coast where this MPA would become uh, once it is de designated. So I knew from my experience there the amazing beauty that's right offshore. Uh, you have dolphins, seals, whales, you have these amazing golden kelp forests. So I wanted to communicate that. And at the same time, I learned about in 1969, the oil spill in Santa Barbara, which remains the biggest in California's history. And when you're in Santa Barbara, you can see, as I just mentioned, these beautiful sites, but you can also see the huge oil rigs that were responsible uh, for this oil spill. And you can also see also the distance at Channel Islands. Um, so in researching for the section that I wrote, I learned about more about the Chumash history. Uh, Chumash is a, an indigenous tribe, a Native American tribe that has inhabited this region for thousands and thousands of years. And the creation story of the Chumash tells how about 15,000 years ago or more, they moved from one of the Channel Islands that you can see about 30 kilometers offshore uh, to what is now mainland California. And in this process of migration, some of them did not survive. And those who fell into the ocean were saved by being turned into dolphins um, so that they would avoid drowning. And so the Chumash know them as their brothers and sisters. So then kind of all these elements combine where you have the beautiful scenery off the coast, you have these oil rigs that are very recently, about 50 years ago, responsible for a massively destructive oil spill. And then you have the Chumash heritage that extends thousands of years, but kind of interweaves all these elements together. Um, so taking all these elements and combining them, I try to make this section a bit memorable. Uh, I think there's something like 16,000 MPAs around the world. So you know, what's gonna make you remember just this one? Um, so hopefully it's these um, different pieces of the puzzle. And I think storytelling, of course, we can talk about this in the Q&A section later, but it's, it's such an essential element um, in conservation. And thank you very much for joining this webinar. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Summer. Uh, I'm based here in the UK. Uh, and I was just entranced by listening to Zarek's story there. I think it's, I mean, it kind of goes to show how powerful storytelling is, right? And I guess that's what this toolkit is kind of aimed for. It's how we're using our knowledge and communicating our knowledge and having that passion for this knowledge as well. Um, I had an amazing time working on this toolkit and meeting these incredibly lovely people. Um, each of them has inspired me in loads of different ways and it's just been an absolute joy to work alongside them. Um, I worked on four different sections, as you can see. Uh, I worked on different ecosystems, different MPAs, um, where I kind of investigated the different types of marine protected area um, and the kind of the protections needed and required for each of those different um, kind of areas that are being protected. Um, that was kind of my first section. My second section was MPAs around the world, so South Pacific, uh, where I looked um, at the Arnavon Community Marine Park, uh, which was an incredible space, um, an incredible area that's been protected by many, many different people. But the people that really spoke to me um, were the lovely women from the Kaweki Women's Network. And they, were just amazing they were very very cool and they're working to conserve and protect kind of their air, that area of the ocean and it's yeah very inspiring to kind of see them work and bringing their that sense of community and involving the community again is a big theme that's running through this toolkit and having the community work to protect their area of the ocean you know it was really really nice to see um i then interviewed two people um, and again, an absolute joy to work with both of them. So I interviewed uh, Fernando Bretos, which was um, just amazing. He kind of is working, um, he does a lot of work with mangroves and he just loves them. And he's just so passionate about it and so passionate about how important they are. And it's his passion for this and his just joy that really came through talking to him. And he was just very excited. He was excited about the opportunities that conservation presents itself. 
and it was really really lovely to kind of talk with somebody who was like you know what we've got some issues going on but it's gonna we're gonna solve them but it's gonna happen um and then talking with sandra turner as well absolutely amazing woman and she was talking about how um how it's everyone's responsibility to look after our ocean and it is our ocean you know we for some reason split the ocean into lots of different like okay so we've got the pacific and then we've got the atlantic and then we've got the indian ocean it's like okay well it's actually all it is all one ocean and it's everyone's responsibility you know it connects us all um, and that really came through in what we were talking about um so yeah both really inspiring conversations um and i'm very very grateful to have met them both um and yeah a big and again another big theme that kind of runs through this toolkit is optimism and being optimistic for the future and we kind of wanted to end on having hope you know and the importance of hope being this catalyst for change and giving people motivation to want to protect our ocean because it is that spark and it is having that passion and having that 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 even tiny opportunity to be like actually wait a second we can do something about this and we will do something about this and we're, we're going to do it it's going to happen and we'll it, yeah it's going to happen um and I guess that's why all you lovely people are sat here watching this. Uh, hello, by the way, thank you for being here. Um, it's because you guys have hope. You have hope for our future. And that's so, so important. Um, because, you know, kind of more negative media uh, and more negative kind of press coverage, it sells, unfortunately. So you hear a lot more about it and you see, you know, scrolling through my news feed in the mornings, it's like, oh, goodness me, like, can we do anything about this? And the answer is yes, because there's people from all over the world that you know I've worked with. We've got you know the amazing people on this panel here. You know we're around the globe, and we're kind of with these integral little points that we are all connected, and we're all connected by this big ocean, by our ocean. And like I said, it's our responsibility to look after it. So kind of having that hope and being, and it's so hard. I know. I know it's really hard being optimistic for the future and you know it's important to surround ourselves with people who have that optimism and it's important to look at you know look at your news feed look at your emails your update emails and say actually you know can I find some other um kind of social media pages of kind of amazing organizations that sell this hope and advertise this hope to people because that's what's going to that's what's, that's what's going to save the world. Um, so looking after ourselves as well, you know, there's a lot of climate anxiety, there's a lot of kind of conservation anxiety, but look after yourselves as well, because it's also really, really important for us to have that hope, for us to pass that joy, pass that passion, that passion on to other people. Um, but it, is, it can be really difficult because you're kind of, you're trying to toe the line between having all this hope and having this optimism and then also knowing what needs to be done because you know it's a big there's a lot of big problems and it's kind of having that line between being like okay there are big problems i know this and being aware of them but then also saying we're going to solve it and we can solve it together um and kind of making sure that kind of going back to julia's earlier point about kind of communicating this science and i think because looking after the because looking after our ocean is everyone's responsibility you need to make sure that kind of when you're talking to people you again like i said are passing on this passion and passing on this hope but also kind of making it relevant to people because i think it's so strange here in the uk i'm based in um oxford at brooks university and i you know i'll go for a walk and i'll go up to a big tall hill and i'll look around and i'm like there's no ocean I can't see it anywhere and it's so it's so easy to feel so removed from it you know but then you know I'm walking along with the canals and I'm like actually there it is there's the ocean and then it rains and I'm like oh there it is again and it's helping people understand that you know yes we're all connected but how are we connected how is it affecting people on a day-to-day -day basis making our messages relevant to people um, and helping them understand that it isn't just a problem for coastal communities is everyone's responsibility, like I said. And kind of focusing on solutions rather than the problems. So kind of acknowledging the problems and saying, okay, so this is a problem, what are we gonna do about it? 
Um, and I think that's really important because when you start changing your mindset of thinking about the opportunities that are being provided rather than just the problems, it can really help, again, yourself and it can help you inspire other people. Um, because like Jacques Cousteau said, people protect what they love. If you can spread that passion, that love, that hope to other people, that is how we're going to save our ocean. Because everyone is, everyone's on board on this one boat, as it were, and we, we can all do it, but we can only do it if we do it together. And I think that's spreading the love, spreading that passion, because everyone here is incredibly passionate, I know it. Spreading that passion and being like, this is, you know, we've got problems, but we're going to do it together. Um, thank you very much. And I think we have one last slide for you, Summer, if you want to share anything about this. Yes, I totally forgot I put that on there. I just got so carried away. Um, but yes, like he says, people protect what they love. So help people know what to love and why to love it and how to love it. And that that's how we're going to save the world. Thank you so much, Summer, and to all the authors for, for sharing your powerful words. Wow, it's it's I'm, I'm sure the listeners can imagine it was it was deeply inspiring for me personally and my team at the Ocean Foundation to work with this incredible group. Um, plus, there was one other amazing author who wasn't able to join us today who also contributed to, to this project. So I'll provide a brief status update on our, our project timeline before we conclude. So we've just completed the content development phase of this project, and we're now transitioning over to graphic design and Spanish translation. Those aspects will also be led by individuals between the ages of 18 to 25, just like our authors. And the toolkit will be published on the Ocean Foundation's website this summer. And we're very excited to share it with this audience and beyond. So please subscribe to our Ocean Literacy email list at the Ocean Foundation to receive our updates. And you're also welcome to reach out to me via email with any questions. My email's here on the screen. So thank you again to our incredibly hardworking, talented authors, to Octo, to the MPA Center, and to National Geographic. All right, thank you so much to all the speakers. That was fantastic. And I know that there are several questions that are already popping up that people want to ask. Um, and so one of the questions, it seems like a good place to start, is from Janet Warburton, who asks, I'm interested in the structure and delivery of the toolkit. Is it videos, written content, lesson plans, kind of how is it, um, what are the different sort of formats that comprise the toolkit? Sure, I can, I can start by responding to that, and then I might hand it over to Sarag to elaborate a little bit on some of the glossary and, and resources that we're including with the toolkit. So it will be published as a digital PDF on the Ocean Foundation's website, and there will be a number of embedded links to other resources and to partner organizations that can provide a lot more detail and detailed information about marine protected areas. And so it will it will live on our website, and uh, you know, for we just think that's going to provide the greatest accessibility for for our global audience. Would you like to add anything, Sarag? Um, yeah, just about the resources section. So we intended for this toolkit. Obviously, it won't be the definitive, you know, one-stop shop for everything related to uh, environmentalism. Um, Instead, it just aims to build on top of what exists and points readers to the other amazing resources that are out there. Um, those are resources that we consulted ourselves as we write the toolkit and also other things that we're sure the audience might be interested uh, to read or we think that they might find valuable. Um, so the resources section has a very comprehensive list of other you know, reports, documents, videos, um, many sorts of things that the audience can also um, consult after reading the toolkit. Thanks. Uh, there was a follow-up question to that, um, which had to do with evaluation and how can you tell that the, the toolkit is having an impact? So have you thought about evaluation or built it into the project at this point? 
Yeah, I think we'll be able to monitor evaluation in some ways through how many people visit the website and be looking at our, our monitoring and evaluation around website visitors because that will be the main, the main home for, for the toolkit. And one other way that we'll be sharing the toolkit is most likely I've submitted a proposal to present about the toolkit at the National Marine Educators Association annual conference, which is coming up this July in the state of Washington here in the United States. So that will be another you know, source of evaluation data. We can look at how many people attend that presentation. And you know, as we're monitoring and evaluating those results, we'll be sharing that as well with our community. Great. Um, and I know a couple of people have asked, will the, will the meeting be recorded? Yes, uh, this webinar is being recorded. So if you aren't able to, um, to stay for the whole thing, or if you want to share it with other folks, we definitely will have the link available and shared after this meeting to all those who registered. Um, so I wanted to ask a question about how you all work together. This is such a great diverse group. And you, as you mentioned, you're, you're representing all different sorts of geographies and cultures. And I'm Curious uh, about your experience in working as a team on this process. Uh, yeah, I can start us off. I sure. um, so <laughs> we we did a WhatsApp group because we needed to kind of like communicate in some other way that wasn't meetings with Francis. Like we had established meetings with Francis through, throughout the process, but at the same time we needed a way to kind of like get to know each other and communicate between each other to kind of like see how we were going to be working like writing and making something that felt completely like like was written smoothly like you know that it wasn't like very different types of writing it felt like chunks so we we made our whatsapp group and we started you know like sending stuff and messages and then for for some sections we kind of like had to put together meetings between ourselves and coordinating uh time zones between the us um i don't know um uh there's the other author that is in here she's from uh, lagos so like africa the us and you know india was was fun to kind of like try and coordinate that kind of thing, but it was mainly through messages. I would like to add to that. Um, honestly, when you're passionate about something, it comes out as uh, being a group of five people, we never face a problem with coordinating meetings. I think when you're passionate about something, you do find time for it. We have had meetings where, say, Sirag was in a zone where it was midnight or I was in a zone where it was midnight and it still totally worked out very fine. So I think passion is what counts and at the end, if you're passionate about it, it works out very smoothly, no matter what time zone. Yeah, Summer, thank you. Thank you sorry. <laughs> very used to school, just putting my hand up <laughs> to the primary school teacher and me. Um, so yeah, I think I was just gonna say, it was really nice to actually, cause we, looked over each other's uh, sections as well which is really lovely and it was really nice to kind of allow because it, it can feel quite separated I think when you're each working on your own individual section and it was really lovely to have the opportunity to look at each other's work and kind of see these puzzle pieces start to fit together um, and I think it was really lovely to kind of have other people look at my work and say like Summer this makes no sense and I'm like okay that's really interesting and then going back and looking and being like actually it doesn't make any sense so actually having somebody else to kind of look at your work and help you make sense of your own thoughts I think was really really helpful and then also kind of like boosting people up I think was really important it was really nice to read other people's work and say actually you've done amazing this is brilliant um and I think, you know, credit where credit's due, it was really lovely to kind of have such a lovely team where everyone was absolutely willing to, um, you know, request feedback and then take on feedback and then also acknowledging the really great parts that uh, each, author, each author had written because, you know, these guys have written some amazing things. Um, so that was, yeah, it's been lovely to be surrounded by so many amazing people. That's fantastic. So I know there were a couple of other questions just about sort of how the project was organized. 
Um, one is about whether um, you as student writers were paid and whether the subjects that you interviewed were also compensated for their time. I can respond to, to that question. Um, all of the authors were paid, and that is a huge priority for us at the Ocean Foundation to make sure that people are, are compensated for, for their work, um, especially young people that are looking to start out on their career path. And so that's something that for our work, you know, broadly and our work within DEIJ, we just really prioritize that, that people are compensated for, for their contributions to ocean conservation. Um, there was not funding available for the parties that were interviewed, um, but their, I think their time was, you know, somewhat minimal compared to the hard work that the, that the authors put in. And of course, the next chapter, which includes the graphic design and Spanish translation phase, those folks will also be compensated for their work. Yeah, and since you mentioned that, Francis, there is a question about when can people expect to hear for the next phase if they have uh, applied to participate in that as graphic designers or translators? We will be sending out those notices this week and next week for those that have applied for those RFPs. Great. Um, and I had noticed and commented about the diversity of this group geographically and culturally, and you mentioned that you have another um, writer from Africa. So it's really nice to see that, that geographic diversity. Um, there was a question about whether you had um, approached indigenous groups to include their perspectives in the toolkit. Um, so I can talked to, uh, about this. So uh, certainly for many sections, that was the case. For my section, it was definitely the case. So I um, have reached out to the Northern Chumash Tribal Council um, for feedback and for their approval on my section and to learn more from uh, about their perspective. And it was very important, I think, for all the authors as well as for the um, for Francis to that we consult uh, with indigenous uh, community members and tribal leaders um, and incorporate their perspective wherever possible. Thank you, Sarag. And I noticed also that there was a, a big emphasis on culture and community throughout the case studies and examples that you provided. And I just wonder if any of you would like to comment on the role of community engagement and culture in the conservation of the ocean. I can say a little bit. Um, I, I've i been working with communities in, in, in Mexico, in Baja California for a while. And I then I, it's something I told everyone when we started like meeting. I think that the first step is communities have to be open for help. They have to be, um, there's have to be this trust and this cooperation built upon so that other, um, stakeholders like government and scientists and NGOs can actually help them because they are the ones that are need to learn and have to learn to adapt to what's changing right now in the oceans because of climate change. So uh, they are the ones asking for help and being like, uh, we need to understand why there's no more fish or we need to understand what is happening with this situation. And it's it's very important to create that relationship between um, the community and the people that can actually help because they have the money or they have the knowledge or they have the, the resources. So it was very important for all of us to kind of like actually talk to those communities and see what's going on with them when we wrote. Thanks, and AJ, I know you had your hand up too. Yeah, I would like to emphasize on the culture part. So uh, having worked on a story that is pre predominantly focusing on um, traditional knowledge and say the ancestral beliefs, I, I think Hui Makana Omakana community of Hawaii is doing a great work. They are, they are predominantly bringing back their traditional practices, which were less harmful to the ocean. And those practices of fishing or remo removing invasive species has really helped the ecosystem in general. And in, I think in similar lines, even the new island and people across the world, they are starting to realize that their traditional practices were much more sustainable and caring for the ocean. Just basic things like reserving ocean during breeding season of fish or say removing the invasive species more compared to the species which are native to the place. 
or 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 just small things like this like uh, not kayaking to the nursery areas are some really incredible things they used to do in past and they're bringing back those things again so that is something very interesting i found about all, all of these interviews thank you there is a question about will the tool could be free and I'm, I'm thinking that it likely will but francis i'll let you answer that and will it be available to informal educators and there was also a question about um, any kind of mentoring for educators that would be provided for the use of the tool Sure, yeah, the toolkit will be entirely free. It'll be widely available on the Ocean Foundation's website this summer, so we hope it'll be accessible to everyone. And once it's translated into Spanish, you know, hopefully useful for Spanish speaking individuals as well. And the initiative that I'm leading at the Ocean Foundation is, is very interested in providing mentorship for educators. We have a get involved form on that page and I'll, I'll share that link with the organizers so they can send out that information. So that's just a simple Google form that listeners can complete to express their interest either in serving as a mentor or in being involved as a mentee. And so we're trying to bridge those connections within the marine education community um, with our initiative, Koji. We're also doing some interesting mentorship related work with Women in Science, and that is a partnership with, with NOAA and also through the peer-to-peer -peer ocean acidification mentoring program. So that is something I'm very interested in and very passionate about. We hadn't specifically talked about mentorship as it pertains to the toolkit, but if the authors are willing to share their contact information, perhaps listeners could reach out to them directly and explore those opportunities. Yeah, you've actually segued right into one of the next questions, which was if the um, authors would be interested in sharing their social media contact information, um, and maybe you can do that as a follow-up to this. I think some folks would be interested in following you on social media and staying in touch after this. Uh, so thanks, Francis, for that. Um, just wanted to pass on that there are a couple of comments that are just saying how excited they are to see the passion and the commitment among this group and how inspiring it is to see that, um, how wonderful it is to see such a passionate group of young people working hard to save our oceans. Thank you all for your efforts. Keep up the great work. Um, so nice, nice to really be able to pass that on. Um, there was a question about um, what kind of training you all were provided, if any, to, to do this writing, um, or did you just kind of jump in and learn as you went? Um, maybe I can answer this one. So sure. we were provided opportunities uh, by the Ocean Foundation um, to join two conferences. Um, so the NAAEE -A -A -E -E, um, conference that happened a few months back, as well as Impact 5. Um, so those are very useful opportunities for us to um, engage with, you know, educators around the world who are presenting uh, things that they had learned over the past year and years. Um, and I think to a large extent, it was also just a matter of jumping in and kind of figuring, figuring it out as we went along. Um, so the two kind of went hand in hand. We were given, I think, a great amount of support and opportunities to um, develop our own like professional skills. Um, and at the same time, we were given the freedom to really just do it how, you know, we saw fit, how we could best do it, how we felt we wanted it to be done. Um, make mistakes, you know, get feedback, make mistakes again, get feedback, make mistakes a third time because <laughs> there were three feedback, um, you know, sites. Um, and this upcoming final deadline you know now we've um hopefully gotten it right thanks Thank Sarag, you. and i'll just add a little bit on to that so you know we did try to provide additional educational opportunities for for the authors as Sarag mentioned but even though these are young people, they really brought an incredible level of experience to this project. They each you know, have done a lot already within ocean conservation and environmental literacy. I mean, Rebecca authored an award-winning uh, toolkit focused on, on education, so, so she brought that to the table. Sarag has served as an executive director already, so and, and many other achievements. So they, they really brought a lot to the table, and we were excited to be able to, to draw from that experience. 
we also formed an advisory committee that contributed to the review process. So in addition to our team at the Ocean Foundation, there were external parties that provided feedback on their on their work and just kind of kept helping ask the right, the right questions. And then I think in a way they sort of trained and coached each other because this is such a diverse group and they have such unique backgrounds that they really, as we've heard, they've really supported and, and trained each other throughout the process. Fantastic. So there were a couple of questions about connections to the UN um, Ocean Decade uh, on, uh, on science, uh, whether this is being submitted for endorsement by the UN Decade on Ocean Science, and also whether you have been connecting to uh, the UN uh, UNESCO Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission Ocean Literacy work. Um, I think people really recognizing the, the, how nice it is to see a youth-led organization and, and wondering if you have made connections to other ocean literacy work globally. Sure, I'll, I'll start by answering that and then I'd love to hear what the authors are doing in that space. So the Ocean Foundation does have those connections with UNESCO and with the Ocean Decade work. We had not yet considered submitting this, you know, officially through, through those channels, but I do follow along closely with the ocean literacy community, the, the ocean literacy dialogues, and have um, been in touch with the folks over, over there working on that. So it's something we're, we're you know, excited about and, and following along with those developments. Has anyone else in this group been involved in those capacities? So perhaps something okay. we'll, we'll keep looking into. Yeah, and, and of course the ocean decade is till 2030, so lots of opportunities to get involved in the coming years. Uh, so there was a question about, um, you know, previous and historical campaigns to repair and heal ocean problems and that the challenge of not getting discouraged, and I know Summer and some others spoke directly to this, the idea of maintaining our passion and optimism, even in the light of sometimes discouraging news, and also the power of storytelling and ocean heroes, as you described in the toolkit, to, to motivate people to act. And I just wonder if you have thoughts from your generation's perspective of your peers and how, what do you think motivates people to get involved um, since, since this is directed at, at ocean, um, ocean activism among youth. What do you think is needed to help kind of overcome that, that pessimism and inspire people to act? I think, uh, I think uh, part of ocean literacy, um, or at least how I described it earlier was like an understanding, but it also comes with a sense of responsibility and kind of a sense of um, what what we as individuals, but also we as smaller groups and we as a larger society on all those various levels are um, should be doing or um, can do to for environmental work. Um, so I think at least for me, a sense of responsibility is very powerful. And I, I've seen that in some of my peers as well, not all of them, but um, to me, just that the idea that I have the agency to um, create change that can affect someone or an animal halfway across the world is very inspiring to me. Thanks, Rebecca. Yeah, uh, Julia and then Summer. I. I've all often compared um, ocean activism sometimes to um, the the Greek mythology tale of Sisyphus, of this uh, kind of like carrying this big boulder up a mountain and feeling like it's always going to eventually fall down. And I, I'd been, uh, since the pandemic, I've been feeling that way for a while. And then I had my interview with um, Dr. Shireen Rahimi. And she, I, I asked her about it because, you know, she's doing filmmaking and documentary. And, and she told me that hope and optimism is a muscle that we have to kind of like keep working on every day and that you have to see the bad with the good and still think that the world is resilient and that it, even if we can, that we can try our best and it's it's still, it's going to recover in some way. We still are not completely sure, but that it is resilient and that it will recover. So that, that actually opened to me 
a lot of doors and a lot of uh, other new perspectives and also working with uh, this group has been very eye-opening. Thanks. Summer. I think as well it's celebrating those victories I think like especially being British I don't know what it is but like being able to take credit for my work I'm like oh I did a good thing like I find that really difficult for some reason and I think that's really important you know it may be something as small as you know oh I remember to take my reusable shopping bag with me to the shops that's still a win it's still a win you know and I think yeah it's absolutely important to celebrate those small victories and you know bear in mind the big picture and you know what are my next steps what can I realistically do because what is realistic for me isn't going to be realistic for somebody else so it's you know understanding that you know for some people they're going to have to use single-use plastics you know um and that's you know that's okay because they're also doing 10 other really cool things so it's yeah it is about celebrating those small victories keeping that big picture in mind but yeah giving yourself credit as well all right thank you I see that Alice Roberts had her hand up a while back. Alice, I don't know if you're still there, you still have your question. Um, but uh, if you uh, if you wanna ask, go ahead, you're unmuted. No, I think I hit it by accident, but this has been fascinating. I think you all have done great things. And I like what Summer just said about, even if you just do something little, I mean, I'm getting older, I'm 78 now, and you know, what can we do, but just little tiny bits it all adds up. Thank you so much. All right. Um, so I think, you know, we've answered most of the questions. Uh, you know, what I'd like to do is just ask um, if you have something you're planning to do next that you're excited about, either building on the toolkit or in your world as an ocean advocate, maybe we can just quickly go down the row and, and hear from each of you about something that you're inspired about and planning to do uh, in the coming year or two related to your work as ocean advocates. So um, who wants to go first? I can speak to that a little bit. Um, this is maybe on a little, little bit of a smaller scale, but I'm just in the beginning phases of a project um, that will increase accessibility to the outdoors uh, at my university, at Western Washington University. Um, and because we've noticed that you need expensive gear to go outside um, and not everybody can afford that. So I'm starting to work on a project that'll provide a gear library. Mm -hmm. Looking forward to seeing that happen. That's great. Julia, do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, I'm going back to Baja California to work with fishing cooperatives with uh, the Mexican Lab. And we're doing a couple, couple of projects about resilience in different fisheries. Fantastic. All right, Summer. Um, so I've almost finished my uh, teacher training. So hoping that within the next year, I finally get my own class of little ones um, and hoping to kind of bring the ocean into the classroom. Because like I said, like Oxford feels very far away from the ocean, but you know, it, yeah, it's so ingrained in day-to-day -day life that, yeah, I want to bring the ocean into my classroom. That's that's my aim. Great. Sarag. So uh, I, I graduate in a few months um, and will be heading home. So I'm doing engineering, I'm pursuing engineering right now. Um, but I've definitely been of the view recently that my engineering career begins and ends with this degree. <laughs> so I think um, I would love to go back to Egypt, um, where there's definitely a lack of awareness for marine protection. And although there are some uh, MPAs along the Red Sea, I think there's not nearly as many as there should be, and uh, they're not quite enforced. So I would like to get involved with um, ocean conservation on the ground uh, in the Red Sea and uh, see where I go from there. Great. And AJ? So I'm just in the middle of my graduation and I know that I want to go for aquatic veterinarian, to become an aquatic veterinarian. And it's been really fascinating because I did not have this thought before the project. Uh, in the middle of the project, I knew that I wanted to go for aquatic, otherwise I did not have it. And I'm also been, I've also been very excited about media. So I'm planning to do something in 
ocean conservation that brings ocean conservation to forefront of all other issues because ocean is such an ignored space and it needs to be highlighted. That's great. Now, Francis, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to say to wrap us up here. I'm just really grateful to this group and it's been really enlightening and inspiring to, to work with these, these young people and just it gives us all the hope that, that we're looking for to know that each of you are headed down these various career paths and, and charting a new course for, for ocean conservation. So it's, it's really uplifting to, to have been involved with, with each of these people. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's been really wonderful having you here. Thank you so much for sharing about the toolkit and, and the process of developing it and uh, the work that went into it. We're really excited and looking forward to seeing it uh, coming out this summer. And so just to remind folks that the toolkit will be available on the Ocean Foundation website this summer. And um, the, this webinar has been recorded and will be available and sent out to, to all those who registered. So feel free to follow up and uh, We'll also ask any of the participants uh, if they'd like to share their social media contacts, we can uh, share that with participants as well. Thank you so much for joining.